DeLuna Coffee is owned and operated by diehard Florida State fans and boosters, the Lemmix family in Pensacola. So cut them some slack for their hurricane blend. No green and orange, and it's definitely not all about some random letter in the alphabet. It simply is a blend for those of you who love that strong coffee flavor without bitterness. DeLuna has combined two different South American beans with a Hawaiian bean. In fact, the Hurricane Blend has won as many ACC titles as the school in Coral Gables. Try it or one of their other two dozen blends and get a discount when you use the promo code WARCHANT15. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. WarChant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closes only. Now here's WarChant.com's ass on Hunchavandi. And Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up? It is Wake Up War Chant. It is fueled by DeLuna Coffee. DeLunaCoffee.com. Come explore our world of coffee. Use the promo code WarChant15 when you head over to DeLunaCoffee.com. Pensacola Police Midnight Shift Coffee, folks, a unique blend, five, count them, five different beans, each with its own distinct flavor that provide for a blend that gives that extra kick of caffeine when offering a rich, smooth flavor that imparts a character unlike any other. It's the Midnight Shift, and don't forget, portions of this go to empower volunteers across the country to raise awareness and funds for childhood cancer research. Coffee, cancer research, help your fellow man. Help yourself to lunacoffee.com. Warchant.com, your ultimate symbol sports source. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're listening to us on there, hit the thumbs up button as well because Corey Clark is here. Corey, I haven't even asked how you are in our pre-show production meeting, so I'll ask it now. How are you? I'm good, buddy. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? I'm good. Okay, a little, good. A little, little pep. A little pep in the step. I think we got some stuff to talk about today, Corey, that's football related. That's, you know, relevant. I know, okay. I, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm assuming... That headlines was was quite heavy to strong to quite strong on national championship sort of retrospective talk. I, don't, I know we're two days removed from it now as people are listening to it, so I don't want to get too quote unquote bogged down. Uh, your thoughts on the dogs prevailing as a new dynasty upon us in the college football universe? I don't know about that, but it was very exciting. It was exciting that they won, how they won. Um... You know, I know I gave Stetson Bennett grief. Everybody did because he's just not in line with the quarterbacks you see in elite teams. Uh, but it was really cool to see him break down like that, like how much it meant to him. Yeah. Um, it was pretty remarkable, too, when you think about it. Like, you know, Alabama wins every year, and their quarterback is from Pasadena, California. There's no way he grew up an Alabama fan. Their head coach is from West Virginia. He's not a, he didn't grow up an Alabama fan. The head coach of Georgia is from Bainbridge, Georgia, and played at Georgia. It was a huge Georgia fan growing up, I assume, but clearly has been a was a big Georgia fan as he played football there. And then the quarterback grew up an enormous Georgia fan. Um, it was a walk on, and then went JUCO, and then came back as a walk on. And and um, yeah, man, it just, that that part of it is just a cool story, I think. Uh, and that's what makes that's what can be really cool about college football. His emotions um, on the sideline after that pick six uh, matched my own. Um, which was, uh, actually, no, I didn't start crying. I was excited, though. I hopped up. I jumped up. I was excited. Uh, I, kept, I, yelled him to, I yelled at him to keep running, unlike Kirby, who was telling him to get down. Yeah, seriously. Which, not with three timeouts, man, the game's not over. Nope. nope. Alabama had three timeouts. Get your butt in the end zone. Um, and Kirby even admitted that afterwards. He's like, he was actually right. Like, it was, a, it was the wrong thing for me to tell him with, with them having three timeouts. Um, but, yeah, man, that was, that was cool. And it's really cool for you know, long-suffering. I know they boast. I know they're very a boastful bunch for a program that hadn't won a national title in four decades, but that's a lot of long-suffering Georgia fans that I'm friends with, obviously. Um, it was just a really cool night for them. But, but everybody, as you can tell uh, by the timbre in his voice, I mean, it just does, doesn't bring you nearly the joy it does when Florida State's doing well. At all. Or, it's or, the, or the Braves. Or right. the Braves. You know, but that's what, when you talked about headlines, that's what we, when we, we talked about the championship game, but more um, framing it within Florida State. Like, what, you know, their point, and it's a, it's a fair point, and I'm sure you thought it too. Everybody listening to this probably thought it. Watching that game is like, man, Florida State isn't close to that. They're not close to either. Even with what they're doing in the portal, they're not close to these two teams. Um athletically, 
physically, however you want to say it, it, it looks different. And my counter to that is, yeah, everybody does. Right, right. Um, you know, you're not in, They. it sounds like a shot I'm taking, but I'm going to repeat what I said on headlines. Yeah, it, it was almost like, what it's like watching the Buccaneers host the Eagles this weekend in the playoffs and go, man, Florida State's not close to that. It's like, no, you're not. The, you're not you're not supposed to be close to an NFL team. These two teams are, clo- are, are you know, they're basically NFL farm teams, yeah. and they're loaded. I mean, think about the best player in the ACC was a guy that wasn't sure he'd be able to start at Georgia. So he came to Florida State and won ACC Defensive Player of the Year. That guy was a role player on that defense. He was an all-time star for Florida State. The point being, no, Florida State is not close to that. Neither are 125 other teams in this country. What Florida State's next goal has to be, and might be very soon, be close to the people that were playing in the Outback Bowl. Look oh, like that. Because no. you're, not, you're not far away from that. And that's the next step. Get to an Outback Bowl caliber, and then after that, get to a championship caliber. You don't go from five wins to championship caliber. There's some stops in the middle. And the first one is like, you know, get to a Gator Bowl. Look like those teams. And I don't think Florida State's that far from that. Yeah, they're far from Georgia. So is Michigan. You know, yeah. we saw that. Right. You know, so, but but would Florida State not belong on the field with Michigan? I think Florida State could hold its own with Michigan next season. I'm not saying they'd beat them. They wouldn't be favored to beat them. But Florida State wouldn't be blown off the field by Michigan. And Michigan was a playoff team. So try to try to take those next steps. That's what this portal is doing. And then get to good, and then from good you become great. Um, so that that was my the way I I, I know it. I'm sure I'm sure like I said, Florida State fans were watching that, being like, man, it sure was fun when we were that team. Um, but man, that you're not close to that right now. But rest easy, knowing there aren't many that are, including nobody in your state. We really should have had a pre-show production meetings. I'm not prepared to be the positive guy. If I can be the positive guy, yeah. Uh, Uplift us after that. I mean, well, I, I don't was, think I wasn't trying to be negative. I was just being a realist, but saying that Florida State, you know, you got to climb. That's the part of the climb, right? You don't, you don't just j- go from base camp to the tip. I know, not the man, tip. What's it called? The, yeah, you go from base to the summit. The peak. Yeah, the peak. Yeah, not the tip. I don't say that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you got, you got to, you got to start. You got to go to camp one and camp two, and then finally get yourself to the summit. That's what Florida State's doing. But it does. It doesn't have to take ten years either. It's it just not going to be. It it's not going to be next year, because right, right. You know, uh, you think about that Georgia defense. Nicobe Dean, man, third year in the system. Um, Tyndall, Nolan Smith, Ringo, uh, I think is a sophomore, maybe. Um, Jonathan Jordan. Davis, a fourth year senior. Jordan. Jalen Carter is third year. Like that's what the great programs do is they allow those guys to grow up. Like you know, Nolan. Uh, uh, what's his name? Nicobe Dean wasn't like a star as a freshman. He played some, but he was like... Uh, but he was an absolute blue chip coming out of oh, high school. Oh, no, that's what I'm saying. Miss, that's that's know. the next step. If you get good, blue chip players will start coming to you. And you won't just always have to go to the portal. But the great programs develop from within and then sprinkle in the portal guys. Right now, Florida, Florida State's just having to do a lot of portal guys, uh, mainly portal guys for their starting 22. You know, if you keep winning and you become more enticing to these high school players, the five stars, the Nicobe Deans of the world, then you start built. Those are the building blocks. By the time they're juniors, you might look like that. There's no, you know, look, Florida State in 2010 was different than Florida State in 2013. It took a little time. So hopefully we're in the middle of a climb like that. Hopefully, hopefully. I mean, it's, um, you know, interesting, like, Georgia, what they play in the national title game in Kirby's second season. You know, Bama, I think, wins the national title in, in their second season with Saban. Uh, you know, second season with Well, wouldn't you Urban. say the difference, though, is that Jordan Kirby Florida. wasn't winning with a bunch of freshmen. I mean, Rick Rick recruited pretty well. Yeah. And yeah, this was not a good – this roster wasn't horrible, terrible. It was not good. Uh, so it was not – we were not left in the position to – we weren't at base. We weren't at camp five on the climb. I don't even know how many camps there are, or whatever. But I, I think yes. there's four, Aslan. I okay. think there's four camps. Okay. Um, it, it's just it's all of it's just so hard to reconcile because I, I get it, man. Like, I, I don't want to come here and, and 
you know, tell everybody how far away we are. I mean, I didn't watch that game and think, oh, boy, we are so far away from this. I thought both those teams, I guess maybe credit to their defenses, credit to the familiarity they have with each other, um, you know, both struggle to move the ball. I mean, I guess you can credit that to the defense. But I yeah. was thinking, like, hey, man, like, you know, if you if you believe in this quarterback, which you do, your newly named quarterback coach comes right out and says it in his press conference that, you know, he is our quarterback. He's a stud. This kid can play quarterback, Jordan Travis. I mean, like, if you believe in this guy, you believe in your offensive line coach because you promoted him and made him your offensive coordinator, and you brought in a guy that played in the in the Big Ten – it's going to help you out on your offensive line. You're, according to Michael Lance, you're still going to try to get some more help uh, there on the portal. I, I just this. I'm trying to figure out this line that we're trying to walk here, and by the Royal we that we we like all these kids that are coming in. We all everyone agrees that they're they're instant upgrades over all the guys that were on the team practically last season. Well, like if we believe in this guy. Like, I, don't know, I, don't know, I just don't know how you can square up, like, believing in Mike Norvell, believing that you're getting all these guys that are great in the portal and still being like, all right, let's get seven wins next season. Again, and, I'm not, and I know I'm going to keep talking about this, and I hope you guys don't get sick of this. I'm not trying to be, like, a, a jerk about it. But, again, like, if you believe in this guy and you think all these guys are – these recruits that are coming in, these transfers are instant impact guys that are upgrades, look at this conference. It's not a scary conference. ESPN's too early top 25, which is really just Mark Schleybaugh's, there's three ACC teams in the top 25. All three of them are coming to Tallahassee. He's got NC State eighth, NC State eighth, Clemson eleventh, Wake Forest fourteenth. Man, you you hung with two of those three teams. Why can't you beat them at home with improved quarterback play, with improved wide receivers, with an improved linebacking core, with an older secondary, with this Jared Verse kid that might be every bit uh, as productive as as Kier, maybe close to what Jer- Jermaine did, you know? So that's the way I was looking at it. I'm like, maybe we aren't so far away. We're not going to win a national championship next season. Well, that's what man, I if- mean. Like, no, I don't think Florida State's far away from competing for, like, an Atlantic Division title, which means you're competing for an ACC title. Now, I know that's not what people get excited about, but that's the truth. I don't, I don't think they're that far away from that. They're not. Like, they didn't – Wake Forest was the only team that – beat them comfortably last year, and that was because of six turnovers. And your quarterback, who you didn't start in that game, um, had to leave because he took a vicious hit on a Hail Mary. Um, so, you know, they're not – it's not like they're far away from being that caliber. I wasn't saying that. I'm just – you know, you look at those Georgia teams, and you, I only say it because we got, a, we got a few questions about it on headlines, and then Jeff and Ira were talking about it too, like how, how much of a slap in the face it was to see that kind of, that kind of speed and athleticism on both of those defenses, especially Georgia's, and realize that Florida State's isn't close to that. But again, my point would be nobody is. Nobody. I, mean, I think Georgia's defense gave up 14 touchdowns all season. They gave up two touchdowns total in two playoff games against the number one and number two teams in the country. And one of those touchdowns was after a fumble, quote-unquote. They gave Alabama the ball at the eleven. And the other touchdown was in garbage time when you're up by 30. That's how good that defense was. But that's an all-time defense. That's don't, you, Maybe don't judge yourself on what that defense looked like because there aren't going to be many times you have a N'Kobe Dean, a Nolan Smith, uh, a Jonathan Davis, a Jalen Carter, all on one team, all, all at the same time. And those um, the DBs, I thought, played really well, they, including the kid, the five-star that transferred from Clemson, um, Kendrick. So anyway, but yeah, I think, I think seven to ten wins is reasonable, and depending on how it goes, you would say, okay, again, a building block. You're not going into 2022 thinking you're winning anything, but you can make another significant step, and that's what the portal has done. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't know. my I point, se- I think seven's a disappointment, man. Maybe, but we'll see how it goes. Right? For all we know, LSU might win the national championship. And are we going to be dis- looking back? Are you going to be like, ah, oh, it was a disappointing lo- loss to lose to LSU in New Orleans? That's a problem. Like you play. Wake, none of those games are gimmies, right? Like at Louisville, at Syracuse, Boston College at home with that quarterback, Wake Forest with that quarterback, at NC State with that quarterback, Florida, Clemson at home, at Miami. It's a tough schedule. Right now in January, it looks like a tough schedule. But then I, that's what I was telling Jeff and I off the air was like, uh, you know, in January, if you had asked us, like if we were talking about the upcoming season 2021, with games at Clemson and at Florida, you'd be like, well, let's just let, – let's see if they can keep it within 30 yeah. or 35. Yeah. Well, yeah. they really probably should have won both those games. Mm-hmm. So they, 
perception changes, so we'll see once we get closer to the season when we see what the rosters are and how good these teams are. The point being, again, like I'll, I'll say, they're not good enough yet to go into any season just chalking up win, 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 win. That's a win. That's a win. They should be in every game. If you're in all 12 games and you don't get unlucky, you know, at worst you're six or seven wins. And if you get lucky, you might get to nine. That's what I, that's what I think they are now, whereas two years ago they were awful and they were lucky to even be in a game. They weren't going to be in most games. Now they're, they should be in every game, in every point spread. You know, again, we'll see. We'll see with injuries and everything else. But right now, as we talk on January 12th, every point spread should be within a touchdown when you look at that schedule, right? Yeah. Um, so one way or the other, either favored or underdog by a touchdown or so. So, you know, hope you, hope you play the, the moments that matter well. You figure out ways to win in the fourth quarter, like you kind of did against Miami, we thought, and Boston College, although that was the refs keeping them in that game. We know that. By the way, banner day for the ACC officials in the uh, championship game. Thought they did pretty well overall, considering the the standard. Um, didn't like a couple of calls, including Aslan. Let me ask you this: I know the game was two days ago. All of a sudden, there's you can interfere with a kick catch without touching them. Did you I, see that call? I was watching the Jimbo cast, so some of the stuff I wasn't able to. Oh so yeah, good. I meant to ask you how that went, but and I will. But like, so Georgia punts it. The kid catches it at the thirty-five. The Georgia guy is right near him, like within five inches of him, but doesn't touch him. And they flagged him for kick, kick catch. Oh, yeah. Don't you have like a one-yard halo? Isn't it like a one-yard Do halo? Do you? I because I, I, I watch a 1,000 college football punts. Hey, for years, all we did was watch Florida State punt. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of dudes standing side-by-side side a guy that's catching a ball. I mean, they are right there, like almost like he's delivering a baby. And they're squatting below him waiting for him to fumble. They are that close to him, and it never gets called unless you run into him. I haven't seen the halo rule called. I didn't even know there was such a thing, no, but I haven't seen it two, called in years. It was in 2003, Aslan. It was removed in 2003. Oh, was it really? Yeah. Two, it was so they just messed halo. it up? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so, but yeah, you, you, so I, I think, yeah, like you said, not 10 wins, That's it's just a tough schedule, man. LSU in Louisiana, at Miami, Clemson and Florida at home, at NC. I mean, it's a tough schedule. It's not a it's not a joke of a schedule, um, but yeah, there's nothing to say you can't go on a roll, get some momentum, feel good, and win nine or ten games. But to get to that level, which is what we're all hoping they do, the first step is to become a good program, right? You got to become good, and then you go from good to great. Especially when you're rebuilding from the depths that Florida State's rebuilding from. Georgia, even Alabama, really, man, they never sank as low as Florida State did. You know, they just didn't. They didn't. They didn't have what Florida State just went through. Um, so it's it's it takes a little longer, but they do have the benefit of the portal that expedites rebuilding. Uh, and it, 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 you can go from me, at bad to mediocre and mediocre to good. In my opinion, a lot quicker than you could uh, ten years ago. It was a guy on Zaxby's Buffalo. Buffalo garlic blaze boneless wings meal from Zaxby. Yeah, I remember the guy, except it wasn't. Yeah, a- it was a guy on the Buffalo wing. The guy on the Buffalo wing.com. And I just think in this conference, with what yeah. this team is doing and how they they played in most of these games, um, you you do have to take the bright side of it if you want to get to ten wins. And I'm not a bright side guy, but again, I mean they they were in most of those games. And a lot of them are going to be at home. Yeah, I think I think the Clemson. I think that crowd affected that game. I think being in that sort of environment rattled that team to a certain degree. Uh, I mean, it didn't rattle Jermaine Johnson, but you know, there's only one of those guys you yeah. have on your team. Definitely rattled the offense. I thought in the you second know. half. Um, but it just, I guess you know, I don't want to be talking about both sides of my mouth, but it does go kind of to the to the whole point, and then no one likes hearing it, but and coaches say, and when coaches say, like, you roll your eyes at it, but it's just really how hard it is to win, man. It's so hard to win a national championship. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Georgia, to go 41 years in that state with all the advantages you have built in, what they needed to assemble to finally win one is incredible when you just think about how good that defense is. Uh, that offense, maybe not a whole lot of star power names, but, I mean, they got an NFL offensive coordinator dialing up their plays, and, man, when, when Alabama got the whole fumble touchdown sort of conversion, that whole sequence happened, for them to come out aggressive and connect on big plays, like that's 
I mean, that, that's a team that's like at their push to the to the to the brink, sick of losing all the damn time. Like this is their only they're finally have the opportunity and taking advantage of it. Just there's a confluence of so many things that have to happen for you to win. Um, and I know it sounds so like we again, we were all our eyes when we hear a coach say, but it, it just it shows you how tough it is, man. And that all the conversation afterwards, like I was watching the SEC Network is hey, where do you rank Kirby? in terms of the best coach in the country right now. And is this sustainable? And it's like, well, it's every, of course it's sustainable. You've seen the way he's been recruiting. And it's like, yeah, man, like we know how that, you know, I mean, is this the way that we were doing Everybody's talking about Jimbo like this in January of 2014. Like how can you possibly not keep this rolling? But, you know, life has its own plans for all of us sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah, it'll be interesting with uh with Kirby. But uh, if he does keep, I mean, yeah, they, they're they recruiting their, their tail off right now. And you think like that, that's going to continue into the, uh, not so distant. I mean, they they should be recruiting for a while as long as he's there. But but George always recruited well, even with Rick. Um, they always had top five recruiting classes under him. Um, yeah, Kirby knows what he's doing. He's a very good coach, and uh, they still have not yet had an exceptional quarterback with him yet. Well, they did, and he transferred. Um, they have not had an exceptional quarterback. If that happens, let's see. Remember, Alabama used to win with Coker and McElroy, and then they started getting. You know, they used to win with defense in a running game. And now they have, they just, well, just NFL like, wide receivers just fall off trees. Like you can't even talk about them, though. Alabama is just yeah, that's so right. yeah. far flung of an anomaly that you just you can't compare yourself. You to. think that's about, no, I, I agree. So when you, when you start talking about national championship teams and how hard it is to win a national title, absolutely. Because if you take Alabama out of the equation, well, who's won national titles recently? Um, Auburn with an unbelievably all-time great quarterback with having one year and just putting a team on his back. Um, then you had, what, Florida State with an unbelievable quarterback and an all-time team. Uh, Ohio State, that's the one that's kind of the anomaly. That was also a down Alabama team, I think. Um, and then, like, yeah, who who else? Uh, LSU Joe Burrow? with an all-time like, quarterback. Yeah. And you, you have to have receivers. these incredible – then Georgia with an all-time defense. Like, it takes these – once in a generation type teams are players to win a national championship at most schools. Yeah. And then there's Alabama who just in a down year, they're four minutes away from winning a national title. You know what I mean? Like that's just in it. Not even Both a great year. I mean, receivers. Now, like, could you imagine us going yeah. to Pasadena and like we lost, we lose Kelvin in the ACC championship game against Duke. And then in the first quarter, we lose Rashad. Like, yeah. We're not beating Auburn with Kenny Shaw and Nick O'Leary and Christian Green. Probably love those, not. Love those guys, and, but we're not. You know, and that's, and that's when it, it, it one thing we in. Uh, I think Ira texted it, or maybe you did the uh, the two deep from that national championship game. Oh, that was Ira. Yeah, yeah. That's that might be the difference between like that. That was when you look at the two deep of that national championship team for Florida State. They did get extremely injury lucky. Yes, the offensive line stayed healthy the whole season. So did the entire defense, except for Tyler Hunter. And when you lost Tyler Hunter, who you thought was your star, like not star player, but the position star, he was going to be a guy that was – he was your fifth DB. I guess we'll have to play Jalen Ramsey now. <laughs> but other than that, it wasn't like there was a ton of un, really young talent coming up behind. Like like with, now in hindsight, you know, they just weren't – they weren't nearly as talented. You want me to read the, it? You want me to read the two deep? You can read the offensive. Just read yeah. the offensive lineman. Okay, Cam Irving's backup was Jonathan Wallace. I have no idea who that even is. I'm sorry, yeah. like no disrespect. I I don't even remember that name. Backing up Josue Sterling Love Lady, which I think he left not too long after. Backing up Stork, we all know is Austin Barron. Things didn't work out all that well when he had to kind of step in uh, later on in his career. Backing up Trey Jackson, who got drafted by the Patriots. Reuben Carter. I don't think Reuben ever ended up doing anything in college much. And then Bobby Hart, who I think is still in the NFL somehow, who was like, yeah. what, 17, 18 years old, playing in that bowl game against Notre Dame, was Jacob Ferenkrug, yeah. who we would heard all these great things about playing Juco football or whatever in North Dakota, who was like injury prone and nothing ever uh, amounted to him playing and contributing here at Florida State. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, so that's, not like that's that. rough. Like, yes. it was a great starting 22 and a not very good at all backup 22. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean it's still hey they they most of them came back and they they went and uh, almost won it again the next year even though it was a struggle. Uh, so yeah, I mean I you know we've probably talked too much about Georgia and Alabama, but just framing it with the Florida State. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, I think when you look because we didn't get a chance to talk about the uh, the West Virginia kid, you now got four 
you, you didn't just get better at wide receiver. You are a different room now. Yes. You know what I mean? You've got guys like Micah Pittman and Johnny Wilson have not really accomplished much in college, but neither had Jermaine Johnson until he got here. Now, I'm not saying these two guys are going to have that kind of impact on the offensive side of the ball, but we don't know. They're wild cards. They might. Some guys just blossom when they get to a new place and they get a, maybe more of an opportunity, but it's an immediate upgrade at that wide receiver position, especially over what you had coming back. And then, and then this kid, uh, Wright, right? Isn't that his name? Wright from West Virginia. Winston Wright, yes. Correct. Winston Wright. Winston Wright. What a name, by the way. Um, he's got 120 catches the last two years. And he's got the, two returns, uh, kickoff return touchdowns. Yeah, man. So his speed, he looks kind of like a slot guy. I don't know what they'll do with him. But he's a guy, I mean, 120 catches. I wonder how many of them went for first downs. 80? Is there another player on the Florida State team that's accomplished 80 first downs? Yeah. Like none of these receivers, especially the two, the, the ones not named Keyshawn and Pokey combined, they probably haven't accomplished 15 first downs in their careers. This guy has 80 by himself. He's played in the power five in big games and big stadiums. Um, so they, they've just, they've done such a good job in the portal of addressing their immediate needs. And it's, it, it should make them, if we want to say they were a six win team, like you, like you talk about if they were a six-win team with that receiving core, um, you know, you got to figure competent receiving um, and maybe better linebacker play, you hope, with the kid from UCF, and better offensive line play because you got a good guy from Wisconsin, you got another transfer, and all your guys are a year older and they're supposed to be a year better. All that should translate to uh, two more wins, right? At minimum, so, like at yeah. minimum, at minimum. And, and obviously you believe in this quarterback and if this quarter, he's going to get better if he's as good as, I mean, if you're investing all this sort of equity in him, again, and I believe it, there's, I mean, it was above his pay grade to ask him that. I kind of really wish I would have been more involved in the conference call with Alex Atkins the other week. But, uh, I mean, that didn't sound to me like they think that they have to go out and get somebody that's going to make a difference at quarterback. Like that, I mean, the way Tony Tokar spoke about Jordan Travis was like, I mean, the baton has been handed off from the Kenny Dillingham fan club, you know, presidency has been, you know, the torch has been passed. So, yeah, I mean, if you believe in all these guys, I mean, certainly there's going to be huge, a huge runway for you to get much better, significantly better. And again, this conference, who knows? Although, I mean, I don't think you win this conference, you get into the playoff. I mean, Wake Forest proved that as much. Because they wait. Or Pitt, no, Pete, Pitt beat him, right? Yeah, Pitt ended up in a near six bowl. But yeah, not the uh, yeah. I mean, that's plan. look. That is a possibility. You, in a, it, I, in Clemson, I'm not going to sorry. Not, in, in Clemson, this is Clemson. Something sneaky to watch too. We'll see if they can really kind of keep reloading here. I, I saw like, dude, uh, the quarterback Uyunglele. He threw more picks than touchdowns. He had like nine oh, touchdown passes yeah. and ten picks. He's bad. He's not. He's not good. And uh, I don't know that that roster is set up where it can survive another year of bad quarterback. And play. they don't have any receivers. Like they're, they yep. lost one of their dudes in the portal. Um, they haven't been all that flush with talent at that position either. Uh, well, well he doesn't like hit, he reduce. doesn't like hitting the portal. Well, he's not a believer in the portal. So he, I'm sure he will change his tune very quickly now that reality slapped him in the face with a, you know, it's still a 10 win season. Right. But it was 10 wins and seven of them could have been losses, which has not been the case at Clemson in a good long while. Um, so, yeah, man, the, the ACC is wide open. Florida State fans shouldn't shy away from expectations. Yes. Um, you, you know, nine, ten wins is doable. We just have to see what it looks like. We have to see, you know, we'll, we'll have a better idea, obviously, in August. Um, and you got, you got to hope you survive injuries. And, look, man, I think you got to get better at running back. I think that you, you've still got some portal hits you got to get. Wide receiver's done, right? Like, there's there's nothing left there. You, I hope you, so. You've yeah. taken four. Yeah. Um, so you've completely reshaped that room. You need at least one more defensive lineman, maybe two. I think you need a running back. You might need a quarterback, uh, at least because we don't know what Rodemaker's going to do, and you don't want to go into a season with two quarterbacks, one of them being a true freshman. Uh, because Jordan Travis will get banged up. I'm not saying he'll get hurt and he'll miss games or miss months, but there will be times where he'll have to, you know, maybe get have to miss a series or two. Um and what are you going to throw out there right now? Who's what are your options there? So there's still some holes to fill, but man, you you've got to be excited as a Florida State fan. Other than you know losing the number one player in the country uh, to Jackson State, as I wrote about uh, the other day, you know you got Jamie Robinson came back. 
Uh, that's a big. That's like another you know another portal hit again. That because you were worried that he was leaving, he's back. You got nine guys in the portal. It's probably six of them you think will probably start, which means they're upgrades over what you had coming back. Um, and then, and then all your young guys should be getting better. And you have a quarterback you think is pretty good, unlike last year when you didn't know. So you you should feel you should feel confident that you can at least have a winning season. And then we'll see what it looks like in the middle of October to say if we're if we're chasing championships, baby. I love it. We had you almost on the nine ten win train, and then you you're like, you gotta win yeah, season. man. I just ah oh, so close. I had like, like you're like dangling off the cliff. I had like one hand on you know, like I reached to grab your other hand. And it's you, like you know. uh, they, if they got ten wins, if they got to ten wins, it would have to look like Clemson's ten win season. Yeah, think it about have to Clemson's be gorgeous. Win. Just win some of these. No, games. I know, but like you you think of, number one, Clemson had a a great defense, a championship caliber defense. Florida State. I don't think we'll have that. No, but you think their about their offense wins. Offense won't they, be nearly as horrible. I mean, Clemson's. No, offense you're right. I know. Good. I got you. Hopefully, it, it, it they counterbalances each other. Yes. But you know, Clemson beat Georgia Tech by five, beat Florida State on a with, with two minutes to go. Um, I I'm not, I'm I'm I can't even remember all Boston their other College. Games. They they should have lost to Boston College. I think Boston College. Uh, That's right. Boston College was driving and threw a pick. Yeah. Uh, you know, they just it was that was really close to being a six-loss Clemson team. Well, I think if Florida State gets to 10 wins, it'll be similar. Like, yeah. And I'm talking about a bowl game too, folks, by the way. Right. Um, yeah, you know, 10 three is fine. I'm fine with 10-3. Yeah, but, but if, you get, if you get to 10 wins, it'll have to be two or three like that Miami game from last year. You'll have to win some games where it was really close to losing. You're not going to just roll through eight of those wins. You're going to have to – your heart is going to be racing – in the fourth quarter of half of your wins. Okay. okay. Like Alabama's. Yeah, Alabama right. had a Touché. lot of those wins this year. Touche. Oh, we are going to speak about basketball. We're tacking it on to the end of the program here. Uh, but also do want to mention this reported by our own Gene Williams. Uh, people asking about, uh, you know, Ron Dugan's last week on the Renegade Express. That contract of his is uh, set to expire later on in this month. Uh, you know, according to Gene, doesn't sound likely that Dugan's returns. Um, there was a report out there by On3 Sports that apparently Florida State had reached out to Jawan Sider from Penn State, uh, offered him not only the running back coach position, but also a co-offensive coordinator role. In okay. that sort of scenario, you're you're envisioning David Johnson moves to receivers, which is who he, what he coached at Memphis and when he was at Tennessee. Um, but apparently Georgia running back coach Del McGee could be one of the the primary targets to kind of do this. You'd move McGee, who has been coaching running backs at Georgia, uh, onto your staff, and then you move Johnson, David Johnson, Coach Yak, to receivers. Uh, Also sort of an interesting tidbit to this from Gene's reporting is that uh, apparently Michael Alford, newly named athletic director, has uh, bumped up the budget for the staff. So that's kind of cool. We got a football guy in the 80s, uh, Mm. Perch, kind of realizes how important it is to cut checks. That's... That's super cool. That said, though, I don't, I don't know how likely this is. Uh, I think even Gene kind of lays it out there, not, not putting any sort of probability, likelihood of this happening, but this is just a, a potential target, obviously. Uh, I, it's really tough to pull a guy away from a defending national championship program, uh, one that he's been there for a while. I think he even worked at Georgia State for a while. Uh, I think was on staff that, that beat Florida without completing a forward pass. That was in the year 2014, kids. That was Georgia Southern. Oh, Georgia, I apologize. Georgia Southern. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was at Georgia Southern. Yeah, not, not Georgia State. He was at Georgia Southern. Thank you. Guys. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Thank, go Eagles. Rap That's them, right. Rap them, Statesboro. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, uh, wonder maybe, I don't, know if Dan, I don't know what Dan Lanning's staff looks like at Oregon, which, by the way, I didn't know Oregon opens the season with Georgia next year. That's Isn't that crazy? That's yeah. Nuts. That's nuts. Yeah. But anyhow. He got lucky. He got lucky that most of the guys he just coached aren't going to be on the team next year. <laughs> right. And then a lot of the guys at Oregon are, with the yeah. exception of Kayvon Thibodeau. But, I mean, I guess this just goes more – this is kind of like another brick in building this thing back up, man, is that continuity is a good thing, but there are certain things that have to probably change here. I mean, you're, you're getting a fresh – I don't know if say fresh voice with, with Alex Atkins, who's obviously involved in your game planning and such last year. But, man, you're going you're gonna to kind of dangle out, the, I guess, part of the lure of, of trying to bring Del McGee over from Georgia is offering him a co-offensive coordinator title. So, I mean, you're getting creative. You're trying to figure out ways to get your staff better. You're getting the roster better. If you're getting this uh, this, this coaching staff better on the offense, I mean, the defense, we I think Randy Shannon's pr- 
probably an upgrade over Chris Marv. I don't know how much, but I would say probably at least if you're going to be working in this state, again, just this more sort of evidence to getting it, understanding what needs to be done and going after it. I mean, maybe Ron Dugans ends up staying, but if there's already been one report out there that they made a run at, you know, Penn State's running backs coach and then Gene's heard this, uh, sounds like, you know, there's change afoot, change in the horizon. Well, yeah, there, they have that coaches convention this week. Uh, is oh, that in Indianapolis, by the way? Is that in Indiana? It, I don't know if it rotates. It's I know it was in Texas a few years ago, so I don't but know. But I I'll thought it, it like, though. does it not coincide with the championship game? That makes sense. That's what I was wondering, because I know it does in basketball. I think they have the coaches convention no, at the final four. It's in San four. Antonio, January oh, 9th to 11th, so it's over, All right. actually. So, yeah, it's done now. Um, that's weird that they had they wouldn't be in the site of the championship game, but I guess they don't want you know distractions. But um, but yeah, man, look as we've talked about a lot on this show, and everybody knows you're not a running backs coach is a recruiter, a wide receivers coach is a recruiter, and I don't I I promise you Ron Dugans knows much more about the wide receiver position, how to play it at an elite level or even a not elite level, just how to play the position. Um, you know, how to run a post um, more than I do, a lot more than I do, right? Can we agree on that, Aslan? I don't know, man. You, I mean, you, you understand. Look, I know some things, and, you know. But, so. but yeah, so Ron, Ron Dugans knows more about playing wide receiver than I do, a lot more. I would never come close. Well, guess what? Me and him signed the same amount of high school wide receivers this year. A big, fat zero, which is what? you got to do at that position. You have to bring in talent. Wide receiver, running back, those are the positions where you're not coaching them up for those yards. You're getting dudes. That's it. You go get dudes that can go make plays. You can t you can fine-tune things, sure. You can turn a project guy into a guy that can run routes and knows how to block, sure. But your main job, your main focus is to recruit. And my man went over. So I get why Mike Norvell, after signing day, would have been like, man, we can't. This, this ain't happening, man. This isn't. We're not getting five stars to even look at us. We finally got a couple that we thought we had, and nope, they're both going to the uh, FCS. Um, so is it the SWAC? Yes, correct. Isn't that where they, yeah, they're both in the SWAC. So, um, yeah, man, sorry, Ron. And, and I'm not saying Ron should be fired. I'm not, I'm not advocating for his firing. I'm saying I understand it from Norvell's perspective is you've got to get some guys on this staff that can go recruit at a high level. As, again, as we've talked about, Jimbo Fisher loaded his first staff with dudes who recruit, could recruit. He did not put James Coley on his staff because of his coaching acumen and his way to break down a game plan and break down film and look for schematic advantages. Same thing with Damian Craig. Those two dudes, Eddie Grand, those three guys were on the, on the staff to recruit. And if Ron Dugans or whoever, Marv, whoever, isn't getting the job done, you got to go look elsewhere because now you've got two years of evidence. It's not just COVID anymore, where you can where you can say, well, it was COVID, it was weird. Like you know, you had a, you had a normal year this year, and you still brought in zero high school recruits. Now they made up for it in the portal, but was Ron Dugans a part of that? You know, or that was that more? You know, I I don't know. Yeah. So I I wouldn't be stunned if that happened, um, because yeah, as Iris has said, you know, they haven't released that he he signed an extension. So if he hasn't signed an extension, then what? You know. Why not? Why wouldn't they have released it if he's if they're if they're planning on keeping him and signing him to a contract extension? Why hasn't that been made public? So yeah, they might be might, they might be letting him go and then going to get a, another running backs coach. But whoever they're bringing in has to be an ace recruiter or know a lot of people with money. That's right. hey, that's twenty twenty two man. Have some connections with people with money. If and, you have somebody, if you know a hedge fund manager, please get into coaching. Uh, How Gene. great would be, I'm telling you, man, so the Falcons aren't going to be good for a couple years, and they're going to fire that head coach. Well, I think his name's Arthur Smith, Correct. the Falcons head coach. Correct. He's a billionaire. He is well, a legitimate a billionaire. billionaire. Well, he is, he's got access to billions of dollars. His dad <laughs> is the CEO and founder of FedEx. Fred Smith. So, yeah. Fred Smith, yeah. So this is his son. So wait for the Falcons to fire Arthur Smith and then go hire him and he can pay for everyone himself. I bet he gets an allowance from his dad of $25 million a year, and he can spend half of that on his recruiting class. Oh, man. That's, what, that's the next step in the evolution of college football coaches is just go get rich kids. 
Go get rich kids. Go to country clubs. Go hang out with the hedge fund managers. Are these are these fancy resorts in Miami or Hawaii? And go just find a, a kid fresh out of college that has his degree. Ask him if he wants to be a coach. And there you go. All right, there we go. Got figured out. And if you're wondering if what this means for Odell, uh, Gene made a salient point in a reply on this thread, which is over at the WarChant.com Tribal Council. You would have known about this hours ago, a whole day ago, if you were a subscriber. So I don't know what you guys were waiting on. Uh, but Odell is kind of on the same timeline with him. I think they signed their extensions around the same time, possibly. So you wouldn't announce Odell. So if someone's like, oh, does this mean Odell's not coming or back? It's like, we haven't heard anything that makes us believe that's going to happen. So why would you announce Odell's extension and then not announce Dugan's extension? Like, it'd be weird if you're like, ah, oh, we're bringing Odell back. Right. What, what about this? Well, what about Dugan's? Well, you know, just, you know we're, we're working on that. Probably these things will coincide. Like they will, they will announce. Likely, not likely. Let's take it back, Aslan. If there is a change at that time, they will probably announce. Hey, this is our new guy. It's going to be coaching running backs. Or maybe, maybe it ends up they keep Yak and they find somebody that can coach receivers. And then you also announce, and we're also retaining Odell Hagen's uh, rejoice. So this season, man. Uh, our, our guy Jay, again, in Daytona Beach, like, oh, now you like the portal, huh, Aslan? Which, yeah, I mean, I'm coming around to it, I guess. Kind of have to. Can't, you can't better. shake my fist at the cloud over it or whatever. Uh, but it just, man, there's – the off season is going to be – we always joked about, you know, college football is 365 days a year. And it's like, well, eh, not really. You know, I mean, you, know, you got spring. and But the portal is constantly going to be part of our lives, talking about this on the, on this podcast every day. And we got some coaching stuff too. So, yeah. um, exciting, exciting times. Well, let's step away, make some money, and we'll come back and talk about Florida State Miami basketball. A little bit of an audible, a little bit of a fastball, curveball, whatever is your deceptive pitch. We've got five star Irish O'Fell who is uh, joining us uh, in his journey, sojourn back from the Tucker Center. Florida State, big time win, Irish, 65 to 64 over Miami. All the all the Knowles do now apparently is just beat teams that are undefeated in ACC play. Man, I'm all about it. I like it. Man. <laughs> Definitely a big week for the Knowles, man. I don't I don't know how many people would have predicted this coming to this week. They had just lost that Wake Forest team is not 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 great, and then they and they, the way they looked, they got beat by twenty something, and then going up against as you said, the two teams atop the conference standing, Louisville and Miami, and they knock them both off. This one was uh, a thriller, and and. Really, you could maybe make an argument they stole one. Miami led for over 32 minutes. Florida State only led for about five minutes, uh, but Kate made enough plays down the stretch, and Raekwon Evans hits the two big free throws, and hey, that's another huge win for FSU. Yeah, I mean, Florida State was able to go like on a, on a good run there early in the first half to, to kind of uh, get themselves back in the fight on this. Just what have we learned now from the team? I keep asking Corey about this every single podcast, but I know we're, we're so sort of like anxious – to see everything kind of start clicking. I mean, I don't know if, if a game like this is indicative of or indic- indicative rather of of that happening, but you know, they they need somebody to kind of emerge. They need some of these older dudes to kind of start asserting themselves a little bit more. Anthony Polite a little bit more efficient from the field tonight, but uh, Raekwon and Malik, uh, and then also obviously what Matthew Cleveland was able to do. It, it doesn't matter if these guys. Should we not have been panicking, Ira? I mean, I know it's January. Just to hear the way that Leonard Hamilton was talking about after the game, he sounds like he's kind of confident where they're going to be uh, when things start really the rubber meeting the road. I mean, where were you, what was your mind at and where is it now after seeing Florida State kind of tough out this win against Miami? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely concerned, um, mostly because they're just, you know, and I, and I know Corey's talked about it as well, you just, you, you were worried about the fact that they just weren't going to have enough opportunities to, they were going to have to do something special in conference play to make up for what they did in non-conference. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I was a little bit cautious or curious about when things would come together, um, you know, for the younger guys. And my concern was that the older guys weren't giving them enough to kind of carrying them through those early struggles for the younger guys. And so you were losing games to teams that, you know, you, you, you don't need to lose at home to Syracuse. That's not a great Syracuse team. You don't need to lose like that at Wake Forest. Um, so you started to, you know, you, you start to wonder, okay, if, they, if they've done so much damage to the resume that it's going to keep them, even if they got better by the end of the season, which I figured they would, 
that they may have done so much damage that they can't even get into the tournament unless they win the ACC. But, but I think this was a big win, man. You know, the knocking off these two teams uh, is, I think Miami's really good. I mean, Leonard Hamilton after the game said, and as you said, you have it up on YouTube, the, uh, the video uh, from Hamilton, in the post game. I mean, he said right off the bat, he thinks Miami could be a final four type team. I mean, they're really, really good. Um, so this is a win that's going to stand up. Now is it home? So you don't get as much credit for it. And I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't expect they're going to beat them down there, but if they can, they, they need, they do need to steal some wins on the road. They got Syracuse on the road this weekend. That's one. It would be huge to make up that loss that they had earlier. Um, and, and to your overall question, I, you know, I think where they're, where they're at is, you know, they really truly are improving and, and, and it's, you're starting to see guys get more comfortable. Um, I thought, you know, as you said, Matthew Cleveland's gotten to the point now where he's, He's becoming a guy that you might be able to count on for 12, 15 points a night, uh, which is a big deal for a freshman. He finishes extremely well. Uh, he hit some big free throws tonight. The um, you know Malik Osborne's been banged up. He's got a, an ankle, so he hasn't been playing as, as great. And then Caleb Mills didn't give you much offensively tonight. He had a, maybe one big shot down the stretch, but um, he, he wasn't a big scorer in this game. But they got enough from other guys. They played well defensively. Um, you know, and then, and, you know, and Han talked about this also, it's just that guys, you can see guys processing quicker, you know, they're not he- hesitating as much, um, everything they do, they're actually reacting and not just thinking especially those young guys. And, and that's going to help them out, uh, a ton as they move forward. As the game's winding down, you know, Miami's up. Uh, I mean, what was sort of your, your, your thoughts, uh, when they were able to, to take that lead off the three point shot by Charlie Moore, who just apparently just gets buckets. Uh, but but for Raekwon to to be so assertive, to get to the to the rim and draw the foul, uh, I mean, is that kind of a, maybe a, a flash point? We're hoping, obviously, a turning point, but is is that at least maybe just for Raekwon individually, maybe a, a, a sort of situation we'll be able to kind of pinpoint of him maybe, you know, sort of uh, taking on a bigger lion's share of the responsibility, whether it's scoring points or just trying to try to lead this team, try to spark them. You only, had his, you only had two free throws all night, and there were those last two shots that tied the game and then gave him the win. So It was definitely big for him, no question, especially because he's, you know, he's just had a tough year. I mean, he lost his brother um, just over a month ago, um, you know, to cancer, um, was really emotional, missed some time. Then, uh, you know, hasn't played the way they expect him to play as a veteran. I mean, a fifth or sixth year senior, and he just hasn't um, been quite the guy they expect him to be. And uh, I thought he played well overall tonight for the most part. I mean, he, he, he you know, scored pretty well. He uh, rebounded pretty well. He, he you know, played pretty well defensively. So it was a good game for him in general. But then to come up with that, that play down the stretch was huge. And that, that sequence, the last couple of minutes was, you know, man, it was, it was, Body bow, body bow, you know, both sides. I mean, they were just exchanging haymakers. And, you know, Malik Osborne hits a three. Malik Osborne is playing on a bad ankle, did not shoot well again tonight, hasn't shot well this week because of his injury, and um, hits a huge three with like 27 seconds left to put them up by two. <clears throat> then Miami misses two threes. Uh, FSU, you know, there's, was, that might have been that sequence, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was that right after that. Yeah, it was right after that. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, you know, they get the offensive rebounds, and then uh, Charlie Moore, as you said, hits the three uh, from the corner to put them up. And Raquan Evans, yeah, just man, he just he did not look like he had any doubt he could get to the rim or get fouled. Then when he got the call, I watched him the whole time he walked around from the foul call till when he went to the free throw line. And you know, sometimes guys, sometimes guys look nervous. Sometimes they look like they're trying to be confident. Like you can see sometimes, like field goal kickers, it looks like. They're trying to act confident, even right. though you know they're right. not really confident. Yeah. Um, man, he looked like he was going to – I'll give him credit for it, but he did not look the least bit phased. Didn't look like he was trying to be overconfident, just you know, just like he was doing two free throws in any situation, any game, and knocked them both down. He's a 71% free throw shooter, so it's not like he's an automatic guy. And, uh, man, he didn't – I mean, he just knocked them both down and uh, gave them a huge win. Last thing, Ira, uh, Leonard Hamilton, check out the interview with him over on our YouTube page. Check out about the eight-minute mark. Uh, that's like an all-time ham riff, him talking about. Because there's like that funny sort of Florida State yeah. Twitter meme of all the different faces of Leonard Hamilton, but it's all the same, all the different emotions yeah. of Leonard Hamilton, but it's always the same face. Uh, it, it's kind of it's cool to see him 
you know, we, we see it every now and then off camera or, you know, off the record when we're, you know, talking to him after interviews and stuff, at least when we used to be able to speak to him in person. Uh, but to hear him kind of joke about, you know, don't, don't, don't mistake my smile for me being happy. Sometimes I might be pissed off, but like, what can I do? I can't yell at refs when I'm not getting calls. Just good to see yeah. him kind of uh, warming up to, to this season. It's been up and down for him. So glad, glad he's been able to make a, a good joke out of it. Yeah, it was a funny moment. One of the, it was a young reporter, I think a guy from the FSU maybe, who asked him if, uh, he, you know, he mentioned him smiling on the sideline. I guess TV caught him smiling a few times on the sideline. And he was like, look like you were enjoying the game. And, and, uh, and Leonard's like, uh, yeah, sometimes I, I have to smile to keep from yelling at a ref or, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble. So sometimes I'll just smile. And it was, uh, there were some curious calls, man. There, and again, not to, you know, it wasn't necessarily to blame it on fishing, but there were a few curious calls by one referee in particular where it just seemed like every close call seemed to go Miami's way from this one referee in particular. Well, guess who's the guy that makes the call on the left? Um, so that was kind of cool, you know, because you get it in your mind that, oh, that guy's out to get you. Well, he's yeah. the guy that made the call uh, to send Raekwon Evans to the line for the last shot. But, um, yeah, yeah, it was, it, it, the whole thing was pretty funny. And, and I, you know, I'll give – you got to give Hamilton credit and this and the staff credit because this is a challenging situation. You know, you have you know six or seven first year guys. You have some veterans who have not played as well as you hoped they were going to play. And then you've got the you know the COVID situation. You know, missing so much practice time, uh, having some you know disappointing losses early in the year. Now to have this week, uh, it's it's really good for them and it gives them a chance now. You know, they it, this this win to me gives them a chance now. To put them in a position where if they can steal a couple games on the road, maybe that gets you back to where you need to be for the tournament. If they had lost this game, because you don't think you're probably not going to beat Miami down there, uh, that would have cost you a really quality win. And then, uh, you know, you, again, you're 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 going to have to you're going to have to win some games on the road. But I think the ACC is so wide open that you know after this last week, I feel like their chances have improved dramatically from where I thought they were, you know, just a week ago. Absolutely, Florida State 65-64 win. Over Miami, Ira was in the house at the Tucker Center. We appreciate him uh, taking some time out. Real quick, Ira, uh, 10 wins. Are you on the 10-win bus with me for the football team? Can you, can you, can you, you with me <laughs> I am that? not putting down the gauntlet on 10 wins, Come on. man. Come on, it's, man. Uh, I think they can get to 10 wins. Okay. I think they can I think they can get to 10 wins, okay. but I'm not, uh, I'm not declaring it. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, we appreciate it, Ira. Thank you, man. All right, see you, man. For Ira and Corey, I'm Aslan. Thank you so much for listening to Wake Up War Champ, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemmix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.